Now, for the next two weeks, we are going to be talking about fishing and recalling September 11th, uh, Come and See Sunday. And we've been talking about this uh, for a while. And mark this in your calendars, put this on your schedules, be thinking about this because Come and See Sunday is going to be a day to invite friends and family and neighbors to come and see all the good things that God has been doing here among us. And it's going to be a great worship service with a children's choir that we're putting together. And mission team is going to be hosting a free pulled pork barbecue for the whole community. So be praying for folks that you can invite and, and take the time to, to connect with some neighbors who, who maybe don't have a church and, and invite them to this. It should be a really awesome Sunday. Um, think about someone who doesn't go to church and, and think about inviting them. And as we get geared up for inviting our friends and neighbors to church, I, I want to help us uh, get equipped for the work that we do together, the work of living and sharing the gospel. And we're going to be looking at a couple of stories this week and next from the gospel that have to do with fishing. And it's interesting to me because Jesus surrounded himself with fishermen. His first disciples were fishermen. We see that in the passage we just read. He chose people who know how to work the lines, how to pull in those nets. He chose people who were accustomed to sometimes going out all night and putting in their best effort and catching nothing, having no success. People who knew that the elements don't always cooperate and that sometimes even our best efforts are going to come up empty and what I think we see Jesus doing is living the gospel and sharing the gospel. And I think we see Jesus training others to do that with him. I mean, Jesus goes out and he connects with people. Jesus is where people are. And Simon and Andrew and James and John, they are on the seashore. And that's where Jesus is. Now I'm going to look through the, walk through the scripture, verse 18 it says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. That's Simon, Peter, and Andrew. The two brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew. And, and what's interesting in this passage is that before Jesus goes out, he's also spending considerable time alone. So if you were to go back, like let's say this afternoon, look at the, the first couple of chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, you see that Jesus doesn't launch his ministry, his mission, in a crowd of people. Jesus spends time at first alone, and in fact, he goes out into the desert. He is as alone as he can get, and is there that he wrestles with the devil and all the temptations that the devil throws up against the mission that God has called and sent Jesus to. And we also see Jesus in his ministry. The Gospels frequently mention how he goes and he will escape from his disciples, kind of go out early in the morning before they're awake and spend some time in prayer with God alone. Over and over again, we see in the Gospels the importance of that time of prayer. But what's beautiful about that for me is that he, Jesus, when he does come into his ministry and he does start to call disciples like he does here in this, this couple of verses, it's not some kind of frantic, caffeinated need to, to grab people and drag them to church. I mean, Jesus goes out and he's with them, but he also knows when he has to draw back and when he has to retreat and recollect himself to God and spend some time in prayer, but then he goes. And here's the interesting thing. We see Jesus walking beside the Sea of Galilee, right? That verse there, verse 18, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee and it, it, he saw two brothers and it seems innocent enough that he, he's just walking. But the thing is that he comes with an agenda, right? Jesus has a plan with this. And, and you know, sometimes we say, well, somebody's got an agenda and we say that's not a good thing. You know, like, man, what's up with that guy? He's kind of got an agenda. But an agenda is really just a purpose, it's just a mission, and this is Jesus' agenda. He has something he wants to see happen, and it's this. He wants to see disciples made. And so when he goes out and he's, he's, he's walking and he's paying attention to where people are at and he's connecting with them, that's the, what we see there. He saw two brothers. His agenda is to connect with people, and his mission is to relate to people and then to call them into discipleship, which is always Jesus' mission. We see that again and again in the Gospels. And you know, a lot of times I think 
when we talk about the mission of making discipleship, which our, our word, or making disciples, which our word for that is evangelism, right? Spreading the evangel, the good news. When we talk about evangelism, I don't know about you, but I think for a lot of us, that can make us a little bit nervous because we can think about people on the street corners, right? People who kind of put back you into a corner and try to talk you down, try to get you to make some kind of a commitment right there. And, and then people who can't stop talking, who can't listen, who don't care to get to know us, but just want to induce some kind, of conver- some kind of conversion, maybe a crisis conversion. Do you believe? And if you don't, well, believe now, right? And it's this kind of in-your-face Uh, cornering us on the street. That's happened to me. I've been cornered on the street by people like that, and it makes you kind of nervous. But that's not what we see Jesus doing. We do not see Jesus cornering people and backing them into a corner and engaging into this linguistic wrestling, saying, I'm going to make you believe the gospel. We just see Jesus going out and meeting people And you know, there's not many words here, right? It says, Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers. There's not many words. He just throws out that call, come and follow me. But I think part of the reason there's not not that many words is because we know from the Gospel of Luke, and you can go back and check this out in the early chapters of Luke, that Peter, some of these disciples that Jesus meets here on the seashore, it turns out that they already knew Jesus, that this was not their first encounter with them. Jesus had already stayed at Peter's house. He had already healed Peter's mother-in-law. They had already seen him in action, healing people, teaching people, being with them, sharing their life. They had already taken the time to, to get to know him and him to get to know them, their struggles and their stories. And so when Jesus comes up to them on the beach, it's not his first encounter with them. It's part of this ongoing, developing relationship that he has with them. He went looking for Peter and Andrew, James and John. He went looking for his friends. And you know, in my mind, this is key. I think this is one thing that we want to keep in mind as we're gearing up for Come and See Monday, (laughs) Sunday. Uh, It is Sunday. I think we want to keep this in mind, that Jesus uh, first relates to people, and that that's what we're to do too. I don't think we can win people to Jesus unless we first become their friends. I don't think we can share our faith unless we first spend time sharing life with people. Now think about this. People don't really trust facts and figures. You know, if you want to convince somebody about something, the last thing to do is to show them a graph. What people believe is personal relationships. And we, they don't need us to tell them that, that they're sinners. We don't need to tell, they don't need us to, to be judgmental of them. What people need is, for us, is to see us living the gospel, not, not as perfect people, but just as people, and then connect to them. Because I believe that people connect and relate to other people, not to ideas. In any case, the gospel is not information. The gospel is the good news of a relationship with Jesus and with his people. And so when we're sharing the gospel, we're not really sharing this little bit of information, like just believe this thing, just get this in your head. We're not really sharing relation, an information piece. We're really sharing a relationship. Now, the first thing that I see that Jesus does here is build relationships. So his going is all about living the gospel himself and then living it among others. And I've been doing some thinking about this in a, a little bit over the last couple of months about what is Jesus' way of living the gospel, of sharing the gospel? What are ways that we see churches doing this in our current moment? And one, I've been doing some writing on the rural church, and as part of my work, I've been interviewing pastors of rural, small-town congregations uh, all around the country that have really found a way to take off and grow. And one thing, as I've talked to them, I said, you know, what's, what was the secret sauce? What was the chemistry? What got your congregation going? And one thing that I've heard again and again from these folks is how important relationships are in their congregation's growth. 
their congregations grew because they and others in the congregation went out and connected to people. Now, one pastor, Richard Early, out of Lacey Springs, Virginia, he has led a rural church plant since 1997, and the congregation has grown to some 275 folks on a Sunday morning. And get this, 275 folks on a Sunday morning, and the population of Lacey Springs, Virginia, is only about 150. So, Pastor Early has, you know, attributes this to to God at work, of course, but to, to an emphasis on human connections. And he says that sometimes in our small churches, there's a sense of defeatism. There's a sense of apology among a lot of rural congregations. But what Pastor Early says is that many small congregations have a tremendous ability to connect to people. You know, we know, we know our neighbors in our small towns. We can connect to people. We bump into the same folks again and again in the grocery store. It's not like in a big city where we're all strangers to one another. We have this ability to connect. And Pastor Early says this, don't try to get someone to come to church before they come to you. So first build relationships and then connect people to the church. And I I like that a lot. I think that's good advice. Get folks to come to you before you try to get them to come to church. And what he's not saying is that we have some kind of ulterior motive, that we kind of pretend to care about people just because we want to fill the pews. I mean, that's not it at all. What Pastor Early is saying, and what I agree with, is that we want to get to know people first, that, that this is all about people, that relationships are first. And what matters is connecting with people and hearing their stories, getting to know them and love them. And then when the time is right, then we can give them just a little gentle invitation to hear the story of Jesus in their life. And in fact, we're going to talk about that tonight when we gather for our workshop on three-story evangelism, how uh, our stories connect to Jesus' story, connect to other stories. It's a workshop that you're all invited to that mission team is leading And listen to this, the first skill, the first skill of evangelism is not talking. The first skill of sharing the good news is listening. It is hearing the other person's story. What do they care about? What matters to them? I mean, the the thing is that we we got to get to know people, and then there's not that kind of pressure, that kind of anxiety to to hit them up with the gospel, sharing the gospel will just come out of our caring for them. Now, that kind of sharing starts with being involved in their lives. So this is what we've got to do. We've we've got to meet, meet our neighbors. Go out and meet your neighbors. Go see their kids play sports. Talk to the people sitting next to you in the bleachers. Not long ago, um, I know that one of you struck up a conversation with a lady in the community and end up, ended up inviting her to church. And I thought that was awesome. And this lady said, oh, I know who that pastor is. I know who his wife is. I've met them at the swimming pool. And so I thought that was perfect because it, it was a, first we had gotten to know her a little bit as a neighbor. And that, that process is ongoing. And when that invitation came into her life from somebody else, not from us, she was open to considering it, thinking about it. I was talking to a young Mennonite pastor who had been living and farming and ministering in the Rio Grande Valley in southern Texas, and he he worked among immigrants that and settled folks. He worked among professionals and day laborers, so people all across the spectrum. Some folks spoke Spanish as their main language. Some people spoke English, and there were a bunch of people that spoke a little bit of both. And he said, he said, he just kind of dropped very casually that this congregation he had been a part of and serving for eight years, it was only about 20 people when he got there. And over the eight years, it really never got beyond 120 I said, wow, that's only 120, right? From 20 to 120. And the interesting thing is that that growth that they experienced was not because of his amazing pastoral skills and sermons. He attributed it all to connections and the ways that God was working through human connections. So he was all about working side by side with people on the farm. 
He'd, he'd see them in the community. He and his wife had an, a ministry of inviting people over to eat. And he became part of their lives. And then the church, as kind of a last step, could become a spiritual refuge for them. And this young pastor lived out the gospel from the very core of his being. And that led him to connect to folks. And then to be able to connect them into the life of the church. Now this is the thing. We have to be living the gospel before we can be drawing people into the church. Jesus goes to people before he calls them to discipleship. Jesus is already walking that way. He's already on the way. He's already going. And then he extends that call. And what's interesting is that the call itself involves calling others. So Jesus goes and calls and invites others to call still for others beyond him. As author Edward Stetzer puts it, following and fishing are inseparably linked. And so if you're going to follow Jesus, you've also got to fish. And Jesus keeps on going. You know, Jesus had this charismatic personality. He drew people to himself. And there are some people that have that, and there are some people who don't have that charismatic personality. I don't have that. But here's the thing. We don't have to kind of affect some sort of charisma. We don't have to pretend that we're more bubbly than we are. We just need to be who we are and, and relate to people and connect to people and care for people. And then eventually, when the time is right, there's this call. And we see this in Jesus' own, his own walk. Verse 19, here comes the call. He says, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people or fishers of men. So it's a call to action. Come follow me. It's a call to transformation, a call to change, a call to leave their life behind, which is exactly what they do, to change the way that they, they, they move through the world, to, to follow Jesus in his particular way of life. Come follow me. But Jesus doesn't just relate to people because he's nice. He relates to them because he thinks that the message that he is bearing and the life that he is living and demonstrating, Jesus thinks that is the very best possible way to live. He thinks that following him is the very best gift that he can give to people and share with them. And that is what gives Jesus the courage to say, come, follow me. Now think about this. Do we believe that the gospel message, this message about relationship with Jesus, walking in his way, do we believe that the gospel that we're living is worth sharing? And I think a lot of times we can kind of get down on ourselves. It's like what Pastor Richard Early had said, that, that small churches can kind of get into this apologetic mode, like, oh, you know, we can sort of believe, like, you, you wouldn't want to visit us. I mean, oh, we're... We're, we're really small, or, or well, you know, we're old, or we don't have any kids, or we don't have a guitar band. But, you know, small churches are amazing at relating to people. And no matter how old you are, no matter where you're at in life, I think all of us can relate to people and care, to people, care for people. And I think that is what is going to matter most to folks. I once met this couple. This is like a parable, but this happened. I once met this couple. They were between two churches. There was one church that they, they were really tapped into the theology. They were all about the way this church understand, understood the Bible and the, the way the church understood living out the Christian faith. They liked the theology. But there was another church that they were kind of checking out. And in this church, they didn't like the theology at all. In fact, they thought they were kind of off base. But in that church, there was this older couple who the first Sunday they were there had invited them out and asked them about their lives and took them under their wings. And in the first church where they really liked the theology, nobody seemed to pay much attention to them. Well, do you know which church that they ended up in? The one that had the folks who connected with them. The one that had folks who cared about them. That was the church that they stuck it with, the one where they were loved. Notice this. Notice this when we look at Jesus. His calling is never just for the disciples to follow him. 
It's for his disciples to go out and make further disciples. So Jesus is saying, connect to me. I care about you. Let's be in relationship. And then he's saying, extend that on down the road. You continue to make disciples and connect with people. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of people or fishers of men. I'm passing on my mission to you, says Jesus. It's not just mine. And what he does, what he lives, the walk he walks, he wants to see them walk and live too. So Jesus calls them and then he sends them. Jesus wants his disciples to go. He wants us to go. And you know, we, we never know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it is, this is a story about fishing. It's just like fishing. So some of you, I know, like fishing. Have you, have you ever been fishing? And you know, you go, you go out fishing, you get your, your equipment together, you get all set up, and you put your... your your, your line in the water, is there a guarantee that you're going to catch a fish? No. Right? You, you put your line in the water, and it could be the perfect day in the perfect spot with the perfect bait, and you put your line in the water, and nothing. Or they eat your bait. Right? You may not get a fish. And I think it's just like this in the church. We don't know where relationships are going to lead. And sometimes you'll start to get to know someone and you'll care for someone and, you'll, and then they, they just up and move and they're gone. There are no guarantees, but yet we keep fishing. Now, we were, when we were kids, we had this neighbor growing up and he had an awesome name. I, it always stuck in my head. His name was Fritz Fry. And I was like that. You know, and Fritz like to fish, and I also remember him because he put on a huge fish fry when we were kids. And Fritz's advice was very simple about fishing. If you cast in and you don't get a bite within the first couple minutes, that means there's no fish there. So reel back in and cast again. So in other words, if you, if you, you, you can't get all hung up on the fish that might have been there, that should have bit, if nothing bites, you cast again, you try again, you don't give up, you go and you cast and you repeat. That was Fritz's advice. And you know, just as in fishing, I think so too in the church. Because sometimes we can get frustrated if we try something and it doesn't work. Sometimes we can even get critical of others in the church when they try things and it doesn't seem like it works. And I knew I knew a young pastor who was trying some experimental stuff in this church and the congregation was getting a little bit grumpy because they weren't seeing the growth that they had hoped for. And one of the elders said, you know, you know, pastor, I think they would get behind you if they would just see some results. But that's just it. We don't know what's going to get results until we try it. We don't know what's going to work until we try. And you know, if someone casts a line in the water and doesn't catch anything on the first try, we don't call that person a failure. We don't say, well, that was, that was a wasted cast. Why'd you even cast? You should have known that cast wasn't going to do anything. I mean, we, don't, we don't say that, right? We know that that is just how it works in fishing. You don't get something on every cast. But with church programs, sometimes we can kind of get like that, where we try something or we propose something, and we're, we're quick to write it off if we don't get the results that we want to write away, because we want quick results. Show me the numbers. But think of the times in the Gospels where the disciples are fishing, and they don't catch anything. Think of the times where the disciples, they come, they come back empty-handed, nothing to show for their efforts, no guarantees. And you know, we can be the best people, and we can really care for others, and we can really invite them into discipleship, but still have nothing to show for it. And the thing is, we have no idea, no idea of all that God is doing behind the scenes. We don't know where people are at in their lives, and we don't know the complex ways that our prayers for them are interacting with their own struggles. And you know, numbers matter because numbers mean people, but we can never allow numbers to be our sole measure of success. And I talked to one pastor who could, by my count, 
clearly measure his success and the success of his church, and I don't even like that word success, but he could talk about success by how much his church had grown. But even that pastor said that it can't just be numbers, and he preferred to talk about influence. As, as a church, are we influencing others' lives for Jesus? And I kind of like that, because, you know, I think we could even draw a little chart, you know? Um, think of all the people that you connect to. Think of folks that you're able to help out, or folks that you walk with, folks that you care about. And, and those can all be people who experience the kingdom of God through you, whether or not they ever set foot in the foyer of our church. And, you know, maybe instead of listing our membership in the yearbook, rather than a little line with the number for membership, maybe we ought to list our influence, right? Like go down and each of us chart out, how many people do you connect to? How many people do you care for? How many people do you live the gospel and share the gospel with? And, you know, numbers, numbers are always dangerous and tricky. I mean, talking about success in the church is dangerous because we can always get caught up in our culture's vision of success, the dream of bigger, better, faster, stronger. With the talk of success, we always risk nodding to what Pastor Eugene Peterson calls king number. And Peterson writes in one book, how is it that it has come to pass that after 20 centuries of rejection, the North American Christians assume that a claim by numbers is a certificate of divine approval. The significance of the church has never been in king number. We would do well to remember what happened to King David when he relied on counting in 1 Samuel 24, and you can check that out at home. But in an effort to quantify his military power, David sent out Joab and the commanders of his armies, and he asked them to make a census of all the Israelites. And for nine months and 20 days, they passed through the land counting men of fighting age, right? David wanted to know, how many men do I have who can swing a sword or wield a spear? I want to know because I want to be able to figure out what my strategy is. But when the commanders made their report, David was cut to the heart and convicted by what he had done. Because he realized that rather than relying on the king of the universe, David had come to trust in king number. And David, in the end of this story, had to sacrifice his ambitious counting on a hastily constructed altar on the threshing floor of a guy named Aruana, or Ornan, the Jebusite. And in the books of Samuel and Kings, those are the last of King David's acts. And when, where the first book of Samuel begins with a warning to Israel about desiring a king, the second book ends with David's repentant sacrifice for doing what kings do, measuring their success by numbers. And there's more. If you remember this story, or if you want to check this out, it's not just a temporary altar that David constructs. In fact, David decides to locate the temple to God at that altar on Aruana's uh, threshing floor. And so in a very real way, the temple, the temple that becomes the center of Israel's worship, the temple is a monument to resisting the narrative of success by counting. It is a monument to not counting people, but counting on God. The temple of Israel is this visible reminder that our success does not rely on numbers. And then, in fact, it can be dangerous to leaders of God's people to hang their hopes, their, their self-worth, and the worth of their ministry on numbers. Ultimately, Jesus is calling us to faithfulness. And faithfulness is not measured in numbers. It's measured in our willingness to follow Jesus and living the gospel and sharing the gospel. But being faithful does mean sharing our faith. And that's not just for the pastor. It's not just for the mission team. It's for all of us. And my hope is this. This is my hope. That God will light a fire in us. My hope is this, that we will have a passion, especially in these next couple weeks, to go out and share our faith with others. Because, you know, the world is full of folks that are hurting, folks that 
need to hear the good news of Jesus. And I have one other hope. You know, when you go fishing, you, you got to make room in your boat. If your boat, if all the seats in your boat are filled, you can't get the fish in. And we've got these amazing seats up front here. Here's my other hope, that you would consider, just, just think about the next two weeks moving forward so that our guests can have a safe space at the back. So that, that's my hope, that we make a little bit of space here in the boat so that by moving forward, so that our guests can have a, a seat in the back. That's, I'm, I'm not pushing, I'm just asking. Let's make some room in the boat. So folks, brothers and sisters, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's follow Jesus. Let's connect to people. Let's love people. Let's share our faith. Let's share the gospel. Let's go fishing. Amen.